For instance, um, we'll just skip a little bit ahead, and I'm just going to show you one quick thing. So let's take, for instance, the, the medications, okay? So I have my medications. I have urosemide, carbetalol. Okay. If you were to just take that and type it into, like, you know, drugs.com or rxlist.com or Hippocrates or your Lexicomp or whatever else, look at pages and pages of information about that drug, right? These are all well-researched drugs. They've been used for years. But that's not going to help you for this test. And honestly, as a clinician, too, that's not really going to help you. You are not a pharmaceutical rep for these drugs. You are just going to try to understand what is the relevant information that you need to know about these drugs. And in this particular course, what you're going to be using is you're going to be using. Did I shut it down? Oh no. You're going to be using this PowerPoint. This is Dr. Unai's first lecture from um, about the cardiovascular conditions, right? So this is the lecture that we're going to use. In fact, let's just go to slide 41. This is going to be sort of the pertinent information about your antihypertensive drugs. So do you really need to know the PowerPoints or memorize them like you have for other courses like systems or micro or something? No. The test is not entirely from PowerPoints. It's not going to say, on slide 41, the last bullet point says, what is one of the most common? No, it's not like that, right? But what it does do is it'll give you what are some important side effects that you probably need to know about antihypertensives. So the question will be something along the lines of, I think this patient is called Peter. Right. So a test question could be something along the lines of, uh, Peter is currently taking uh, carvedilol. What is one possible side effect uh, that Peter may experience due to taking this drug? So carvedilol is a non-specific alpha, beta, whatever. And at that point, you'll sort of figure it out from there. So everybody got that? I hope that wasn't too confusing. I mean, honestly, you need to, the PowerPoints in order to sort of direct what information you want to glean from the case. That's how you use the PowerPoints. You're not memorizing everything on the slide. The PowerPoint kind of directs what you need to get from the case. That is potentially test the material. So having given that little explanation, let's actually do a case. Your exam is roughly, I want to say, around 50 to 60 questions. Uh, at least that's what it was last year. And it had four such cases. So Dr. and I is going to upload four of these cases for you uh, on Griffin this Friday. You're going to be in charge of knowing everything about these cases. And basically from there, your test questions will come primarily from the cases, sort of guided by the PowerPoints. OK? So this is one case that I think we had last year. I'm not entirely sure. But it's a case that Dr. Unai shared with me for this exercise. Uh, it's very similar to the cases that we did last year. So we're just going to start with this one and sort of work through uh, the way. Th I'm just going to show you how I study for this. And of course, I realize not everybody's going to study the same way I do. But this will at least give you a good idea about how to tackle this information, because a lot of you have expressed sort of frustration about, like, you know, we don't even know where to start. We don't even know where to end. What do we do? So this is the sort of rough way I like to study. And you're more than welcome to change it according to your learning path. Are there any questions before we begin? Awesome. So the first case is uh, about Peter. And we're going to start with the CC, the chief complaint. So Peter is a 72-year-old male who presents stating, my bridges are loose. And not a whole lot of information in that statement, right? First of all, the gentleman is 72 years old. So I'm not trying to be particularly discriminatory against our seniors here. But the older one gets, the more assaults the body is face, the more conditions they're going to have, the more complicated their conditions are going to be, right? So 72, I'm expecting whatever he has is probably pretty serious. Also, it's going to be part of this course, which means it's going to be serious. So, you know, there's multiple reasons why the 72 is going to be relevant, and my bridges are loose. So that could be, again, a multitude of things. It could be that his bridges themselves weren't you know, well made. It could be that his teeth are loose. It could be that the bridges are broken. Who knows? But from this, the only relevant points are 72-year-old. So bridges are loose. So from this, we can get two things. First of all, the patient is partially 
potential is, right? If you have a bridge, you're missing a couple teeth at least, and multiple, you're missing multiple teeth. And they're loose, so there could be some periodontal issues, there could be some restorative issues, could be something, you know, like trauma-related maybe, maybe got punched in the face, who knows, right? There could be some trauma. We'll figure it out as we go on through the rest of the case. Okay, so HPI. First of all, what is HPI? Excellent. So, Peter is WDWF. Everybody know what that is? Well developed, well nourished. WNL is within normal limits. But so basically, he's just saying he's a uh, he looks you know normal, average, nothing nothing that uh, sort of sticks out. Moderately overweight. Okay. So you guys just had your lecture on endocrine. Moderately overweight. You know, girth of the abdomen, and I'm not really one to complain about that, but girth of the abdomen, what conditions are you expecting? Diabetes. Diabetes, that's a, that's a good one. And I'm going to leave it as a question mark, because maybe he has it, maybe he doesn't, I don't want to judge. Um, but he's an overweight male who's concerned about three cracked bridges in the upper right, lower right, and upper left of his mouth. He also states that his gums are swollen and painful, and that bubbles develop at the gum line of his lower teeth. He avoids chewing with his left side, as this is the most painful area. His last dental cleaning was last year. So lots of good stuff in there. So what are you guys thinking? I'm sorry? Dental condition is horrible. Okay, so dental condition is horrible. Let's elaborate a little bit more. What exactly about a dental condition is horrible? Periodontal. Okay, that's good. So he has some perio issues, probably. I mean, it says that his last cleaning was a year ago. Is this guy like you know one of those super healthy people flossing multiple times a day, brushing multiple times a day? He doesn't need a cleaning at all. Probably not. Probably not. This is a person who's already lost several teeth. Their health is going to be questionable. He should probably have had like you know, multiple cleanings a year. So periodontal issues are certainly there. What about the sort of uh, cracked bridges? I'm sorry. Bruxer, could be bruxism. So the, the bottom line is that we're expecting some sort of anomalies, right? It could be bruxism. It could just be that you know, the restorations fail. That could happen. It's a 72-year-old you know, gentleman. He, he might have had this restoration a while back. So there's, uh, there's bruxism slash restorative failure. OK. And then there's this point about uh, his gums are swollen and painful, and bubbles develop at the gum line. Do you guys, can you think of anything that sort of fits that description? Abscess, maybe? People are saying abscess, right? Swollen gums, cracked bridges. There could be some endodontic issues. We don't know. I know, because I, I took a sneak peek, sorry. But you're going to find out in a couple seconds. So this is this patient's full mouth uh, series, okay? This is also given to you in the case. I just put it as a separate image because I'm presenting it to you. I figured you'd appreciate having it a little blown up. So right now, we're not looking for caries. We're just looking for major issues. So if I see severe bone loss, maybe fractures, you know, anything like that. So you guys see anything on these two PAs of the posteriors? That's this one and this one. I don't really see a whole lot, honestly. Um, so let's move to the anteriors. So stop me if you see anything. Okay, I see the bridges, right? See the bridges right here. Um, there's a little bit of resorption on the bridges, but not, nothing particularly serious. Um, obviously, it tells us that his bridges are cracked, so that's relevant, but that's nothing too huge. Ooh. Oh, I, I don't think anybody has that. <laughs> right. So that, right there. What is that? It's a root fracture. What's that? That's, at the very least, right now it's just a radiograph. I can say it's a pile, right? It's a very radiograph radio lucency. So this patient definitely has some issues going on. What about this right here? Another one. And that's on his left side. Very consistent. The patient doesn't want to chew on his left because he has a bunch of endo restorative perio issues. So this is not going to be uh, you know, an easy uh, case sort of dental. Let's keep kind of scrolling by. Some more issues. 
Anybody see anything? Right, right, right here. There's a huge perio defect right there, right? So there's some perio issues, there's some endo issues. The main point of all of this so far is just to kind of gauge where the patient is dentally. So on a scale of say, you know, good, bad, poor, excellent, where, where is this patient, dentally speaking? Poor. Yeah, pretty poor. Uh, he's in a lot of pain, that's why you're here, so. Um, let's look at all the systemic issues so that we can actually see how we're going to deal with his dental treatment, okay? So now we're getting into the uh, main portion that relates to this course, uh, which is all the medical side of it. Okay, so PMH. What is PMH? Past medical history. Past medical history. Okay, so there's going to be some good stuff here. Uh, HTN. Hypertension. Hypertension. That's going to be a huge one. So I'm just going to put that down first. We'll elaborate on it later. SP heart failure one year ago. Is heart failure something that you care about as a dentist? Yes. Uh, so heart failure is another one. Okay. I'm guessing, yeah, it's acceptable. So it's, yeah. it's been basically in this person, um, the length of diagnosis is also important, right? Heart failure is not someone who's lived very long with it. Um, next we have coronary heart disease. I'm going to just put that down too because it's important. Um, gout. What is gout? <coughs> this is from a while back, and I don't think you guys have discussed that yet in this course. <laughs> Joint pain, uric acid crystals, I'm hearing all this stuff. Great. So, just to summarize gout very quickly, um, in case it shows up on one of your cases, gout is hyperuricemia leading to uric acid crystals being deposited mostly in the joints. Okay? It's going to be relevant because later on we have drugs that will treat this condition as well. Um, next we have uh, anemia with B12. Again, that's going to be relevant to us. Do you guys remember what kind of anemia you have with B12 deficiency? Pernicious or it's a type of megaloblastic. Very nice. So it's pernicious anemia. Okay. And the last one is kidneys. Now, do you guys know why we're worried about this patient's kidneys? Hypertension. Gout. Anything else? Hypertension. Hypertension. What is the what is the link between hypertension and kidney damage? Right. So there's a variety of heart changes that affect kidney function, right? So you mentioned one, sodium retention. But effectively, what the, the main link is. Um, Hypertension is the second most common cause of end-stage renal disease, right? We just went over the most common cause, which was diabetes, but hypertension is the second most common cause. Target organ damage, right? Eyes, kidneys, those two other ones, which I forgot now. Uh, but basically, that's, that's uh, the main link here, kidneys. So hypertension, what are some uh, relevant, what is hypertension? Let's just define the disease. What is hypertension? High blood pressure. I think we know enough about hypertension that we don't need to elaborate more. Heart failure. What is heart failure? Failure of the pump. Next is coronary heart disease. What is coronary heart disease? This is going to be ischemic heart disease, as she's described in one of her lectures, right? So that is basically failure of um, perfusion of the heart. And then the last one is kidneys. So what we're worried about with kidneys is going to be drug. Uh, interactions, primarily excretion of drugs is going to be uh, uh, inhibited, and of course it can be a cause of death eventually. So past hospitalizations, now we have appendectomy 40 years ago. Do you think that's relevant? No. 40 years ago, appendectomy, what, what, what would we a dentist be doing in his gut, right? So we're going we're gonna to leave that one alone. Inguinal hernia, four years ago. So what is inguinal hernia? What's a hernia in general? Uh, okay, so we're not exactly clear on that. Let's not waste too much time on it because it's not particularly relevant, okay? But an inguinal hernia, if it has any complications, are all gastroenterology related. So it's all going to be related to the gut. Again, 
not really my primary concern, so I'm going to skip that one. Angioplasty and stent two years ago. Is that relevant to us? Yes. And the guy has a whole bunch of heart issues. Of course, it's going to be the most relevant here. So angioplasty. What is angioplasty? First of all. Balloon angioplasty. We all, we all these, right? So it's basically vascular surgery. And which condition do you think you had angioplasty for? So going back. Coronary heart disease. Okay? So this is the sort of way you want to link up the information from the past and uh, from each of these categories. Okay, the next is going to be stent. So first of all, something that we need to know about stents. How many different types of stents do we generally use? Anybody remember? Okay, but there are certain stents for which we have to do a certain kind of drug. You guys know what I'm getting at here pretty clumsily? Right, so we, we might have to do uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. That's definitely one consideration. But in order for this patient to just survive with a stent in their heart, what? I'm sorry? Blood thinners. Blood thinners. Let's be a little bit more specific. Because there's multiple types of blood thinners, right? There's the antiplatelet agents. There's the anticoagulation agents. Which ones are we going to use? So, yeah, in this case, we're probably going to use anticoagulant. So stents... And that is going to become relevant to us because we do not like bleeding, right? We're basically microsurgeons when we're working inside the patient's mouth. We don't want our field of view obscured by blood. So that might be a potential concern. Um, let's look at the other one. Cataract surgery three years ago. Is that relevant to us? I didn't think so. So moving on to the medications. And this is probably everybody's least favorite uh, portion of every case. So, lisinopril. What do we think about? I'm hearing prills. Prills. ACE inhibitors. What is an ACE inhibitor? Well, it stops ACE. So, ACE is angiotensin converting enzyme, right? What exactly does it do? It takes this substance called angiotensin 1, converts it to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin. Angio is in blood, tensin as in tension. Constricts the blood vessels. That is what angiotensin does. So ACE inhibitor stops angiotensin. Angiotensin being stopped is going to not constrict the blood vessels or dilate. And why would we want to dilate the blood vessels of someone who has hypertension? Okay, so lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. It effectively vasodilates. And now, one sort of extra little point here. Why are we using lisinopril in this patient? Lisinopril is generally used in patients who have the potential for uh, compromised kidney function. If a diabetic has hypertension, the first drug of choice that you're going to go for is an ACE inhibitor, or what's called an angiotensin receptor blocker. And the reason is, their kidneys are sort of not in the best shape. And that's why this is something that actually will help the status of the kidneys, as well as the heart. Two birds with one stone, excellent drug for this particular patient. So this is going to be basic dilation as well as kidney function. Okay, now let's look at the rest. Furosemide. Anybody remember furosemide? Diuretic. <coughs> a good place to start. It's a water pill, right? It causes the patient to not uh, accumulate too much volume in their uh, body, excrete it uh, primarily through urination. So, what type of diuretic is it? Lupus. Loop diuretic. Very nice. You guys remember your systems one. So, it's a loop diuretic, and the loop diuretic primarily works through sodium. Potassium chlorine. It stops you know, this uh, um, sodium potassium chlorine co-transporter in the loop of Henry. So the important things to remember about furosemide is it is a diuretic. Is that good or bad for the kidneys? And of course, the other part is furosemide is a sulfur drug. Technically, it's not a sulfur antibiotic, but it's a sulfur drug. So potential for allergies. I'm mentioning this because this is not yet something that you guys have covered. 
Okay, so I'm just sort of giving you a preview of some of the important points that you will get in the future. Um, but things that you have covered, I'm kind of leading you to it as opposed to just stating it. Uh, let's deal with carvedilol. What is carvedilol? All all immediately should introduce or should you know bring ideas about beta blockers or some sort of you know anticholinergic, right? So carvedilol is actually a pretty unique drug. It is a non-specific alpha and beta blocker. Okay. So again, it works primarily by uh, reducing automaticity, all that good stuff from System One. You can uh, look it up if you like. My point here is going to be that there's three drugs, at least, that we're using for its hypertension. So it's going to be controlled or uncontrolled. <coughs> so let's, let's recap this. If I have a patient who's on one drug, that means that one drug alone is enough for this patient, right? Do you guys know where I'm going with this? Right. One drug is not enough. Two is not enough. We are using three different classes of antihypertensives. Therefore, this is a patient who is pretty compromised. His hypertensive status is fairly bad, so this is going to be you know, one of those multi-drug treatment regimen, right? The condition is pretty bad uh, as far as hypertension. And why is that relevant? That's the reason why he has heart failure, right? Isn't uncontrolled hypertension one of the things that leads into heart failure? Let's look at uh, isosorbide dinitrate. Anybody know what that is? A nitrate for chest pains. Nitrates for chest pains, very nice. Um, one quick point about this, this is the long-acting nitrate. This is going to be for his, what condition, again? Coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease. So it's long-acting vasodilator, and this is coronary heart disease. Okay, uh, allopurinol. Uh, this is probably a drug that you may remember, but this is something that is related to gout. Allopurinol is what is called a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. And what it does is it stops this enzyme that makes gout in the body. So why would we, or sorry, it stops uric acid uh, synthesis in the body. Why is that relevant? Because gout is accumulation of uric acid, right? So that's the main point you need to take from allopurinol. Uh, just to mention, uh, the major side effect for allopurinol, I have to look this one up. I don't remember this one. Um, allergies. And so if you have like sort of a rash or any sort of necrotizing uh, you know, uh, lesion anywhere on the body, that's the main side effect. Next we're going to look at Coumadin. So what is Coumadin? Blood thinner. Blood thinner, specifically, do you guys remember any? Which factors? 2, 7, 9, 10. Or the vitamin K factors. Just remember them as the vitamin K factors. Okay? So I'm just going to write this as an anticoagulant. Stops coagulation. Now, do you really need to remember 2, 7, 9, 10? Probably not. But the reason I bring that up is it might help you to remember this. Warfarin is a very long acting drug, right? Do you guys remember heparin bridging? Okay, so why is that a problem for us? Bleeding words. So does that mean I can just tell my patient, don't take warfarin, everything is fine? No. The effects of warfarin will last fairly long. So this is why you have to do what's called heparin bridging. You wait until warfarin is effectively removed from the body, and in the meantime, you give them a drug called heparin, which is another anticoagulant, or slightly differently, but same general effect. And you use that on a short-term basis as a blood test, as we're continually calling these anticoagulants, okay? So the main issue with this is bleeding risk. And it's hard to time sort of emergency treatment. Um, to just kind of tie it back to the dental portion of this case, this too. Uh, if it is going to have to come out, or these teeth, if they're going to have to come out, we're going to have to do some pretty involved extractions, right? This is why uh, we're concerned about warfarin. And I think there's one more, B12. Why is he taking B12? For anemia. Simple as that. Bioidentical. 
By the way, uh, Kumiden, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this. Why is he taking it? It's because he has a stamp, probably a drug eluding stamp, right? And of course, um, he may have other issues that we'll find out about soon. Allergies, no, no drug allergies. Anything important there? Family history. What exactly is worth taking note of here? Family history of heart disease. There's heart issues everywhere. So this is a patient who's at very high risk of uh, deteriorating further. Social history. Um, I'm just gonna do this one really quickly because it's very basic. Um, smoking, that's relevant. Alcohol, that's relevant. Um, denies illicit and higher sexual behavior. So we're not expecting any STDs. We're not expecting uh, you know, any issues with uh, substance abuse. But smoking and alcohol, are they risk factors for hypertension? Again, yeah, we just tied into that, but nothing too big there. Review of systems. H-E-E-N-T and stomatonapic. So reports nosebleeds three to four times per year, also has gingival bleeding when brushing. Whoa, that's, is that normal for this guy? So does he have some sort of coagulopathy or some sort of disease associated with clotting, or what exactly is it? Actually, you do know. You've been answering it the whole time. Warfarin. He's been taking warfarin, right? What is warfarin? It stops clotting. And if one stops clotting, even the tiniest little thing will cause them to bleed. So this is actually pretty explained. So bleeding episodes. Warfarin really. Most likely. Yes, Nick. Couldn't it just also be really related to like periodontal problems? For the bleeding gums, yes, but the three to four the nose, nose bleeds. Mm -hmm. Epistaxis is like associated primarily with like uh, the you know, coagulopathy, like hemophilia and all those, right? Yeah. So the main thing, uh, you're right. Let's, let's separate that. So gums could be periodontal and potentially coagulation related. So, CD, um, no chest heaviness, pain, or palpitations. Okay, that's good. Um, hematologic, bruising and prolonged bleeding after a cut. Again, makes sense. We're giving him a drug that prevents clotting, therefore you're going to have bruising. So, it's the anticoagulant effect. Musculoskeletal, oh, I'm sorry, this one. Uh, GU, no difficulty urination or stones. So that's a good thing, right? I mean, again, we're worried about this patient's overall kidney condition. It seems like overall kidneys are working fine. It's just associated with other conditions that this patient has. So, from the urinary system. Musculoskeletal has a hard time sitting for a long time, but believes because of his gout and also aging. That seems pretty normal, right? Again, gout, we already discussed, something to do with the joints, not a very comfortable disease. Uh, it's called gouty arthritis. It's fine, it's understandable. Um, the viral signs. So based on his blood pressure, where does he stand? Is Three. he pre-hypertensive, hypertensive, stage one, stage two, what are we doing? So he is right now pre-hypertensive after he is on three Again, all that tells me is fully controlled. Pulse is 80 and respiration is 15. Those are both normal values. Okay, physical exam finding. Bilateral edema on ankles, puffy hands and fingers. Oral exam is significant for dry mouth, draining fistula. Okay, bilateral edema of ankles, puffiness of the hands and fingers. Right side heart failure? Heart failure, and somebody said right side heart failure. Thank you. Absolutely. It's... It is right side heart failure. This is from the peripheral edema. The volume accumulation, right? Um, there's plenty more that we can uh, uh, look at for the heart failure side, but it's enough, we already sort of understand. Uh, oral exam is significant for dry mouth and a drained fistula in number 30 and 31. So this goes back to the endo side of things, right? We know uh, he has uh, certain issues. 
Anything that uh, you guys think could be potentially causing his dry mouth? Yeah, he wants so many drugs. The cocktail of drugs, there are so many that are very common, and it's mostly due to uh, uh, you know, having medication, so there's so many. Um, he has generalized attrition, moderate mobility, and most of his posterior natural teeth. Sorry, uh, from, from what you remember, would she ask questions like, what specific drugs cause your insomnia, or was it, is it more like, you know? Good question. There are certain categories that are known to cause more severe xerostomia than others, right? Um, Anti-seizure, probably the best one to go to anytime you uh, are worried about xerostomia. But I think that uh, every drug, pretty much, has some kind of minor GI symptoms, right? Like diarrhea, or like, you know, bloating, or it can have some sort of, you know, minor dental symptom, like xerostomia. Those kinds of um, side effects are good to know, but they're not the highest yield information. And this is because, you know, they're not all that per pertinent or relevant, because there's a million different things that can cause that. What you should know is for each of these drugs, the major, major side effects, or the ones that she's highlighted in class, and I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, he has generalized attrition, moderate mobility. Okay, all of that sounds uh, good for our, our sort of graduation requirements because he's gonna need RPDs and endo and perio and all that stuff. But in all honesty, as far as his medical management is concerned, what are the sort of the what are the dental implications towards this patient's medical management? That's my question. What sort of problems do you see when he needs a bunch of extractions? That's some bleeding. And he's not going to clot. Um, periodontal and restorative. Any sort of uh, problems that we see with this? Restorative should immediately ring a bell somewhere. I'm sorry? Xerostomia, so that means he's going to have a high restorative need. And what's the first thing that you... Local. Okay, what's specifically in local? Epi. Right. Anytime we're going to have to do restorative dentistry, I mean, unless it's like a, you know, very sort of cosmetic veneer, you're going to have to use local anesthetic. And you're preferably going to want to use local anesthetic with epinephrine. You guys remember the rule? How many carpules of... Uh, um, if not, what is the other local that you can use? Mepivacaine. Mepivacaine, 3% mepivacaine, no epinephrine, excellent for uh, hypertensive patients. Um, the fabrication of partial dentures, any problem that you see with that? Not really. At least I don't. There could be one, but it, it's nothing that immediately jumps out at me uh, from the medical side of it. Okay. And we're almost done, by the way, with the case. So let's look at labs. Uh, medical consultation with an internist reveals a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. You guys remember atrial fibrillation? What is it? It's the fluttering of the right atria at like 300 beats per minute. It's like the heart rate. That's atrial flutter. And that's a very close, very good explanation of atrial flutter. And atrial fibrillation is pretty much the same. The beats per minute is can be as high, but it can also be a little bit lower. The basic idea is that the heart muscle is supposed to sort of coordinate and squeeze the blood into the ventricles, right? From the atria to ventricles. If the coordination is lost, that's what we call fibrillation. That's what AFib is, that's what BFib is. So when ventricles fibrillate, that's where you bust out the paddles and clear and shock the patient because we want to basically reset the muscle activity and hopefully it restarts in a coordinated fashion to pump blood. So in the case of atrial fibrillation, the heart is kind of sitting still in the atria because it's not coordinated, right? What could that potentially lead to? Anytime the heart, uh, blood is sort of kept still, what happens to the blood? Stasis, clotting. This guy's not clotting though, why is that? So you wanna always keep connecting these back to the conditions the patient has, you want to keep, why would he have atrial fibrillation, by the way? Hypertensive, long time, recently got diagnosed with heart failure. Is it any surprise that his heart muscle is giving out? No. Let's look at the next finding. Echo findings are remarkable for enlarged left ventricular chamber size. Okay. 
What does that indicate? Larger chamber and also abnormal wall motion and estimated ejection fraction of 40%. Hypertension leading to heart failure. So basically this entire uh, thing that we just read is basically HDM leading to HF. Problem, all kinds of problems. First of all, you have AFib. And you also have the uh, ventricular ejection issue. Do you guys remember what the rough range of ejection fractions is? Seven. Yeah. And let's look at this guy, 40%. That's why he's in heart failure. Um, me. And now this is the second least favorite portion of every case that you're going to ever have to work out, the lab values. So generally, um, Dr. and I on the test, by the way, will give you these cases printed out. Um, in case you've forgotten, the portion that I highlighted is this patient's actual value. This is normal range. Okay? So let's just do a quick run. WBC. First of all, what is WBC? If it's low, the patient is? If it's low. If it's low, the patient is immune compromised. Right? They don't have enough blood, white blood cells. If there's way, way, way too much, what do you expect? Leukemia, lymphoma, autoimmune, something, right? In this case, is it normal or abnormal? <laughs> normal, good. Red blood cells. Anemia. Low, okay, low, and anemia, right? So, RBC, anemia related. Uh, next is gonna be hemoglobin. What about hemoglobin, is it high or low? Slightly low, but Definitely low, and again, that makes sense, right? Anemia related. So HP, low, that's anemia related. Okay, next we have the MCV. Do you guys remember what MCV or MCHC are? I'm sorry, I did skip the hematocrit. Is the hematocrit normal or low? Same reason, right? Okay, low, anemia. MCV, MCHC. These are interesting ones, you don't really need to uh, commit these to memory, I suppose, but it's a very useful thing to know. MCV is called the mean corpuscular volume. It's the volume of each red blood cell. In megaloblastic or pernicious anemia, you expect your red blood cells to be larger, right? In microcytic anemias, you expect them to be smaller. This is systems five. It, it's, it's probably been a while, but um, in this case, is it normal or is it abnormal? 94. So it's, on the higher end, but it's still within the normal range. He has anemia, we already know it, okay? Uh, it's generally used for the diagnosis of what type of anemia, if that was not given to you. We already know the type of anemia, not so relevant here, but interesting to know. Uh, MCHC is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin content, is the amount of hemoglobin. Is it normal or is it, uh... yeah, it's normal. And that actually makes sense. If you remember the specific values for pernicious anemia, this pattern fits it perfectly. Uh, platelets. Oh, wow. Okay, and why is that? Why did they have platelet issues? We'll put a pin in that. We're gonna let that, we'll answer that in, the, in just a little bit. But. Uh, do you guys remember the most important number as far as platelets? At what point do you not want to do any sort of surgical intervention on a patient? 50,000. It's a very important number, please remember it. Uh, sometimes you'll get you know, a question along the lines of, you know, the patient's platelet count has just dropped to 46,000, uh, 46, not dollars, <laughs> not dollars, I promise you, 46,000 per microliter. And then what do you do? You just, you know, don't, you, would not want to operate on that patient electively. Um, you don't need to worry about how to fix that uh, in this particular course. And then EGFR is 45 milliliters per minute. So what is GFR? Glomerular filtration rate, a measure of the kidney function. And if it's 45, there was a very handy slide that Dr. and I had. I just flipped that. So where does he stand on this particular? 
So from this I have <coughs> GFR is 5K. So at this point, we've effectively worked out the case. I have all the pertinent information that I want from this case at a first pass. Now what I'm going to do is, anything on here that I do not know, or anything on here that I want to further uh, understand, I'm going to go to either the web, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint from Systems 1, I'm going to go back to, I don't know, whatever review books you guys use for boards, and you're going to supplement this information. If you don't know enough about ACE inhibitors, for instance, you don't know when they're used, what exactly they do, go back and review that. If you don't know what furosemide is, go back and review that. Okay? If you forgot sort of like, you know, the thing about stents, right? If you forgot about the stents and the valves and when you have to do antibiotic prophylaxis, you go back and review that. And this is sort of where the PowerPoints come in very handy because generally they have those review slides right at the end, which have most of this information. So maybe not this particular part, but this kind of goes over fibrillation, anticoagulants. Remember the INR? Different people either will tell you different values for INR, but just know the range for, you know, target INR before you do large surgical procedures. More about AFib, all these points. So this is where you want to go back to your, um, excuse me, you want to go back to your review slides and the PowerPoint. One last thing is when you're thinking about dental implications, if you haven't memorized them, or if you're trying to look up which side effects are going to be the most relevant to your exam, then I'm going to go back to this one. So this is the dental implications and pretty soon I'm going to have side effects. Xerostomia taste alteration. Is this particular patient that we were talking about right now, he had carbetalol, which is an adrenergic blocker. He had furosemide, which is a diuretic. So we expect xerostomia, taste alteration. We expect lichenoid reaction, right? This is sort of how people tie together. The case, you work up independently almost, just trying to, you know, scan it for any pertinent information, Make a list of that pertinent information, then jump back to the PowerPoint, jump back to your review material, and sort of put it all together. <coughs> it doesn't take that long. Believe me when I say that. Right now, I started 4.30 now? No, 3.30. 3.35. It really doesn't take that long to just scan a case for all the pertinent information. Yes, it's going to take you several hours to go back and review all of these things, but this is the way that you want to do it. And um, uh, please don't mind me saying this, but uh, a very popular way of studying for this course is let's split up the case. Uh, Valentina, you do the medications, hospitalizations, and allergies for this patient. Quinn, why don't you do the PMH, HPI, and CC? And I'll do the rest. Okay, and then a ball meat brick. Uh, that's not a very good strategy because the test, the patients, the cases, you don't get to split up and delegate. So it's really, you know, I, I'm not just saying that, I'm not preaching from the soapbox here. It's literally something that, uh, it's a very common mistake that's made. Please don't make that. Don't try to split up this case. You'll get four of these, by the way. So don't say, you know, yeah, uh, let's pick 20 people, five people work on each case. Okay, we'll meet back with this giant document of like, you know, 50 pages, has all the slides and all the information. And then, you know, we're just gonna put it all together and then we'll read that and we'll be good. Because that was one of the major areas that, you know, my class, uh, 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 we missed that. And that was, the, um, that was the real reason why this exam was so challenging. Okay? As you saw, just scanning the case doesn't take very long. Reviewing that information does take a long time. And you want to do this preferably this weekend because your test is next Friday. So you have all of next week if you need to ask somebody, you know, Dr. Yunai or one of the other lecturers about any questions you may have. Carly. Oh, it's, it's the same 
in four cases on the that should be asked oh, yeah. questions about? So this case that I just did, uh, let's pretend for a second this is on your exam. Not. But if you pretend for a second this is on your exam, she will send you this document without all the red stuff that I just typed in. Okay? She expects you to do the same sort of thing. Scan the case for information, go review anything that you're missing or anything that you need clarification on, and then she will give you a printed out version of this case on your exam. So you don't have to remember his name, his age, what his problems are, what his drugs are. I mean, you need to remember what they do, you need to remember how you're going to treat the problems, you need to remember those diseases and how they work, but you don't really need to remember Peter's a 72 year old and oh, which bridges did he have, who are you, are. no, that part is all given to you because you will have the case printed out. Does that make sense? You don't have to remember the details of the case, you just need to remember the portion of the case that you would like to study. And again, uh, if I was to, if I was going to study for this course, by the way, in preparation for this little mini presentation, I requested the lectures that you guys were presented so far. I went back to last year's lectures for the remainder of the portion that shows up on your midterm. I went through the PowerPoints myself, which is why I can literally you know, flip back to this one and just say, oh, ischemic heart disease. Okay. Somewhere in here, she talks about the different types of nitrates. Um, there we go, short acting, long acting, right? So this is the way you want to be. You want to read those PowerPoints and be sort of, you know, very familiar with them. And when you get the case, you can immediately flip back to the PowerPoint and say, oh, he's taking isosorbide dinitrate <coughs> instead of nitroglycerin. Excellent. In terms of Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't talk about thrombocytopenia. My apologies. So, in this case, what exactly could cause thrombocytopenia? Well, first of all, where do platelets come from? Bone marrow. Bone marrow, specifically metacaryocytes, right? This patient has uh, pretty severe anemia, honestly. Uh, so, all the blood cells go down. This guy doesn't have pancytopenia because his white blood cells are normal, but it's that similar sort of effect. If that anemia goes untreated for very long uh, periods of time, the bone marrow tries to compensate by taking away resources from one type of cell and giving it to the other one. Especially in this guy's case because of you know, the uh, clotting issues. Another potential reason is sometimes for drug eluting stents, and this also I think comes from this lecture. Uh, uh, one of the most common types of uh, uh, pharmacotherapy for drug eluting stents are actually antiplatelet agents, like clopidogrel, you know, all those ones, right? So it could be sort of a, a, a remnant of that. Uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm not able to, see I'm not that familiar yet, but I'm not able to find the exact slides, but uh, there we go. Antiplatelet agents. So you could have certain antiplatelet agents that could be contributing to that that he, this patient has a history of using. There's potential uh, multiple causes for it. So that effectively sums up how you should tackle this course material. When you look at the cases, scan for information. That's basically all I did here today in about 40-ish minutes. Once you scanned it, you need to go back and review the material for yourself. And I highly, highly advise you to not split up the cases. I mean, if you have absolutely no time and you had like a day to work out four cases, I can understand, but she will give you these cases with about a week's worth of time. So you should definitely be able to, uh, I know there's a lot going on in dental school. Been there a year ago, so. But uh, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely doable and worth the investment in time because uh, this was, again, uh, the course that a lot of people in my class got MPs in, uh, and it is pretty avoidable. Yeah. Um, did you test, did you review any of the old cases from the previous weeks, or were the four cases sufficient? The, the four cases that she posts are the ones for the midterm. The previous case, I mean, you're more than welcome to review it because, you know, I remember one of the cases that we did uh, had the <coughs> in there. And uh, I had Dr. Feldenfeld as my sort of the you know, case, um, the, per the person who was like sort of kind of <laughs> filling the case with us. 
And he mentions a very important point about lupus that we hadn't gone over at that point in the course. So I went through those, and I found those useful, but it's entirely up to you. If you guys took notes during those case presentations and you love that stuff, go for it. But uh, the most important things are going through the four cases she posts up, and the PowerPoints, and other reference materials. And if you guys really want to know, by the way, for the drugs, um, personal opinion, RxList and drugs.com and Hippocrates are just fine. They have plenty of information and go over all the major side effects. But uh, if you want to, you can always use your lexicon. If you already purchased them and you want to flip through a book instead of a website. Any other questions? That's Edwin, do you have one? Anybody else? It's really not that bad if approached in a systematic fashion. But again, if you sort of delegate, if you sort of split up, you'll learn to help. If you guys have any more questions, please feel free to come up or send me an email. Thank you very much for your time.